Good morning and welcome to our Respiratory Compromise webcast, the prevention, recognition, and intervention of respiratory insufficiency in the hospital. Uh, thank you to Medtronic for bringing us here today. We really appreciate all their support. And with me here today, I have my four colleagues, Dr. Amanda Powers, Surgery and Critical Care, Dr. Monica Goldklang, Medicine and Pulmonary Critical Care, uh, Paul Barron, Respiratory and Acute Care Nurse Practitioner, and myself, Steve Miller, uh, Critical Care Anesthesiology. So today's program is rep uh, Respiratory Compromise uh, Recognition and Intervention. This is a non-CME webinar. And today's learning objectives are to recognize the signs and symptoms of respiratory insufficiency, arrest, and failure (RAAF), and to understand the underlying conditions that contribute to it. Identify risk patients at risk. Understand the benefits of early intervention and respiratory monitoring, and to mitigate respiratory uh, compromise and to intervene early. It's the third most common cause of avoidable deaths in the United States. It's the third most rapidly increasing hospital inpatient cost the fifth top condition leading to increasing hospital cost, and your risk of death is 29 times higher in patients with respiratory compromise during their inpatient stay. It's common, it's costly, it's deadly, and it's very preventable. And your risk factors are, of course, disease processes, aging comorbidities, procedures and surgeries, medications patients are on, including respiratory sedatives, uh, and the care setting they're assigned to on admission. Patients in respiratory distress have decreased or increased respiratory rate, decreased saturation, changes in end tidal CO2, which can be a prelude to failure and arrest. Uh, a patient that's not breathing will be rapidly declining. This uh, disrupts the patient's workflow, it increases the number of complex interventions and costs within the hospital, and it overall will affect not only patient outcome, but their prognosis. The Institute of Acute Respiratory Failure has doubled since 2001 and so is its associated cost. It's a dramatically increasing burden both to patients and to hospital systems. Over 4.1 million patients are at risk, and this could happen anywhere in the hospital, from a simple procedure like endoscopy, to a common thing like total knee replacement or reduction of a fracture, to basic surgery like a hysterectomy, or even procedures such as insertion of a coronary artery stent, coronary bypass, or hip replacement. Respiratory compromise is lots of different patient types and lots of comorbidities. It could be as complex as acute respiratory distress syndrome or as simple as COPD, obesity, sleep apnea, asthma, or end-stage things like pulmonary fibrosis, or more commonly just simple infections like pneumonia or respiratory viral infections. 20% of patients are being monitored for respiratory compromise in the hospital, and early awareness and diagnosis are the real barriers to intervention. The earlier you can diagnose the problem, the earlier you can intervene, intervene, and the more optimally you can treat and even prevent things like intubation. So we're going to go on to our pre uh, first presentation. All right, for our first presentation this morning, we're going to talk about acute asthma exacerbation. We're going to go down to the emergency room for this. We have a 42-year-old woman with diet control diabetes and asthma who presents to the emergency department with some progressive shortness of breath over the last four days in the setting of some upper respiratory infection. Um, on intake, the patient endorses at baseline. Um, she has some chest tightness, cough uh, a few times per week, and some occasional nighttime symptoms. She awakens with some coughing at night per baseline. She uses her albuterol rescue inhaler three to four times per week. Currently, she noticed some upper respiratory tract um, symptoms starting about four days ago and had, had some progressive chest tightness. She's been using her rescue inhaler for um, six times per day with minimal relief, and she presented to the ED um, with her symptoms. Uh, she has been to the ED previously, but has never been admitted for asthma. And as you're doing your intake, we notice that the patient is um, noticeably breathless. So our case here, we have a 40-year-old woman with progressive shortness of breath. She's 5'3", 145 pounds. Her vital signs on um, intake are a heart rate of 90 to 100, so slightly um, tachycardic. Blood pressure is stable in the 140s over 70. She is breathing 26 to 30 times a minute. Um, she is saturating 88% breathing room air. On exam, she is neurologically intact, but she has polyphonic expiratory wheezes throughout her inspiratory cycle. And she is using accessory muscles that are notable when you're um, doing your intake. Her cardiovascular sound is uh, unremarkable, 
she has a mildly obese abdomen um, and her extremities are within normal limits. So one of the things that we um, have to do in the emergency room is uh, calculate her peak expiratory flow rate to kind of get a baseline assessment of how bad her respiratory um, insufficiency is. Um, we have the calculations here. She is based on height and um, her and age. So her um, predicted peak expiratory flow rate is uh, 412 as we have her um, do her peak flow. It comes in at 145, so about 35% of her predicted value. It is interesting to note with peak expiratory flow, if a person does it regularly at home, you want to use what their top baseline um, expiratory flow rate is and um, do your predicted value based on that. But if they don't do it at home, we will use uh, the predicted value. So first question is, how would we characterize her baseline asthma? They're um, using uh, the established guidelines. Uh, we would look at her um, symptoms where she is short of breath uh, a few times a week, um, using her inhaler with some mild uh, symptoms at night um, that would put her in the mild persistent category. And then we also have to think about how would we characterize her acute exacerbation at the current moment in the emergency room. And um, based on her symptoms here, she definitely is having a severe exacerbation of her asthma, um, where her peak expiratory flow rate is 40% of predictive value. She's short of breath with some use of accessory muscles. So what we need to be able to do in um, our patient is to first and foremost monitor um, Work of breathing is the hallmark of failure here. Um, what we have been starting to do is using capnography as a surrogate um, for uh, respiratory failure. Um, uh, baseline blood gas and capnography are um, able to kind of help trend over time someone's uh, entitled CO2, so we can see if someone's having um, increased failure. Capnography is becoming um, ubiquitous throughout the hospital, especially in our emergency rooms uh, where we have to use it now for um, CPR and ACLS. So there's usually capnography available to use. So we put this patient on a capnography via nasal cannula. We are uh, monitoring her, her um, expiratory flow rate, and that is another indicator of responsive therapy, her oxygen saturation. We send off baseline labs with a um, CBC, looking for white blood cell count and infection. Uh, blood gas and a uh, basic metabolic panel. Um, and we also do a culture which uh, looks for a respiratory viral panel. And um, the next step for our treatment for acute asthma exacerbations are medications. The mainstay is short acting beta agonists, steroids, and we'll discuss some adjunctive therapies. So our short-acting beta agonist, um, we also want to make sure um, not only that we are delivering the medicine, but how we deliver it. Most patients at home are using meter dose inhalers. This is something that we typically don't use in the emergency department with acute exacerbation because it is patient um, dependent and uh, disposition of the medication can be poor with someone's shorter breath. So the mainstay is usually a small volume nebulizer. The small volume ne nebulizer uh, usually known as an ACORN nebulizer, is um, flow-driven. It can be uh, driven with oxygen or uh, room air, compressed air. It is very much dependent on how good the flow is to the nebulizer to get the proper um, distribution side of the uh, medication we need to give to the patient. So in outpatient settings, like in an ambulance where you're having to use um, oxygen tanks, we need to make sure we're using the, the proper amount of oxygen flow or in the emergency room where we don't always have um, compressed gas. Um, we want to make sure that we're using proper flow to give the proper medication. Um, one of the things that we've also been using is wire mesh or ultrasonic nebulizer, nebulization. The ultrasonic nebulizer is not dependent on flow. It produces perfect particle size and um, is a portable. So it can be used in an ambulance, to the emergency room, into the ICU. Um, steroids uh, are a mainstay of therapy. It's systemic versus oral. 
it has been shown that systemic um, corticosteroids um, decrease uh, length of stay in the hospital and return to pulmonary function tests over oral. So um, typically, um, solumedrol and uh, solucortef are the two most commonly used. Other adjunctive therapies that we have are uh, magnesium infusion. Magnesium infusion um, has not shown to decrease hospitalization, but it has shown to um, improve pulmonary function tests quicker. Um, there are some side effects with uh, magnesium infusion. Someone who's already having um, some respiratory compromise, it can cause flushing and uh, headaches. Aminophilin has been a long mainstay therapy, but um, recent studies or multiple studies have shown that aminophilin really does not improve outcome. It has a lot of side effects, including um, uh, arrhythmias, you have to monitor um, levels in order to be able to get the correct dose, and it's very time consuming um, for uh, staff to be able to administer it pop, uh, properly. So aminophilin is something that is not actually um, indicated anymore. And then um, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation as a mode of assisting patients um, with a respiratory compromise. So back to our patient, our 42-year-old woman with the mild persistent asthma, presenting with a se severe asthma exacerbation in the setting of her upper respiratory tract infection. Her initial blood gas was 735-3568. She had um, human metanumavirus on her uh, viral swab. She received uh, albuterol, her short-acting beta agonist, um, every 15 minutes times three. She got a dose of uh, solumedrol, 125 milligrams, and was placed on oxygen. After the therapy, we continued monitoring her. Her FEV1 improved to 48%, but she continued to use accessory muscles and have shortness of breath. Her respiratory rate was in the mid-20s, but we had noted using the capnography that her initial <coughs> capnography had matched with her blood gas at 35, and over the next hour and a half or so, her um, entitled CO2 had increased to 40. So overall, we had slight improvement, but continued to have significant symptoms of shortness of breath. So we placed this patient on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Um, we continued our short-acting beta agonist uh, every 15 minutes and admitted her to the medical intensive care unit. In the MICU, uh, we again continued our um, beta agonist. We were able to do a continuous 15 milligram per hour dosing for the next four hours. We uh, continued the systemic steroids, although we um, decreased the dose of 60Q6 and continued on the non-invasive positive pressure ventilation with capnography in order to be able to um, monitor her uh, progression of respiratory failure. Over the next 12 hours, her shortness of breath improved, her physical exam improved, the capnography remained stable, showing that she was not having any further compromise. And in the morning, we were able to liberate her from or positive pressure ventilation and um, space out her uh, albuterol therapies, and we were able to change her systemic steroids to oral prednisone. And so with that, we'll open up for any questions. So Paul, when you um, put people on to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, understanding that our um, entitled CO2 monitor is coming in through the nose, are, is it able to detect when we're using positive pressure ventilation, or are people having to take people on and off? Um, we've had good luck using the uh, nasal capnography with the positive pressure ventilation. Um, there are different modalities that we can use for um, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. The standard that people are probably most familiar with are the nasal masks or nasal pillows that people use for obstructive sleep apnea at home. Um, we find that if someone is in uh, respiratory distress or extremis, that uh, trying to um, get them comfortable with the nasal pillows or nasal mask is a uh, is a challenge. So typically in the emergency room we'll use a full face mask and with that the capnography is working. The full face mask allows the patient to breathe in through the nose or mouth and is a little more comfortable. We have much more control over the tidal volume. We don't have to synchronize the mechanical ventilation with them keeping their mouth open or closed. Okay. Do you feel like sometimes it's hard to get patients to tolerate a full face mask if they've never done it before? It can be. Um, there are other um, instruments out there. They call them the helmet. A lot of people uh, refer to it as the hockey mask. It's a full uh, helmet that goes over the eyes, nose, and mouth. 
Um, those usually aren't available in every emergency room. Um, sometimes we are having to try to help with the anxiety that's inherent with an asthma exacerbation. And if we are um, going to be able to put the patient in a closely monitored setting like a medical intensive care unit, we can use um, intravenous medications like Presidex, which is a central um, alpha-2 agonist that can help with the anxiety component but not decrease the respiratory drive. We, we try to stay away from any benzodiazepines or um, opioids that can de decrease um, level of consciousness, which we need to monitor for failure and respiratory drive. Awesome. So when someone presents to the ER with a suspected acute asthma exacerbation, at what point do you start measuring capnography or entitled CO2? That, that's a great question. Usually what we try to do is um, we'll do our initial assessment and monitoring, and if they're not um, responding to the initial um, short-acting beta agonist, and we're moving forward to see what their um, blood gas is, if we're thinking that they're going to be um, admitted to the hospital, then we'll put them on capnography in order to see um, if they're developing any further respiratory failure. A lot of people will come in with a mild asthma exacerbation. Our patient in this case was severe, but if they came in with a mild ex asthma exacerbation, uh, you might be able to give them one or two breathing treatments and they'd be okay. But the patients that are um, moderate to severe asthma exacerbations, I think that the capnography is a very good tool to use to be able to look for respiratory failure um, where you're not having to poke the patient every 15 to uh, 60 minutes for a blood gas, which can also increase anxiety and increase work of breathing. Right, and take time to come back from time. the lab. Absolutely. <laughs> Very good. Okay, let's okay. go on to our next case. Okay. So this is a case of respiratory compromise in a, a respiratory step-down unit. So this is a 72-year-old gentleman who has hypertension, obesity, and severe COPD, and he was admitted two weeks ago for a COPD exacerbation. At the time of his um, admission, he ended up getting intubated in medical management, including scheduled albuterol, atrovent nebulization, systemic steroids, and antibiotics, um, including atypical coverage. So once the patient's oxygenation improved and the secretion, the, he still had these persistent secretions and hypoventilation due to his underlying lung disease, and so he ultimately underwent a percutaneous tracheostomy. After the percutaneous tracheostomy, his sedation was rapidly weaned to facilitate ventilator weaning. And 48 hours following the tracheostomy, the patient was transferred to the medical step-down unit for ongoing ventilator weaning. Several days later, the bedside monitoring alarms for pulse ox set of 85%, bradycardia to 50, and a dropping end tidal CO2 from 45 all the way down to 20. And on nursing arrival, the patient is in respiratory distress, rapidly dropping oxygen saturation. So Paul talked to us about cases of asthma where our end tidal CO2 is going up as a measure of um, respiratory failure, but there are also cases of respiratory failure where, where in other cases where we'll have end tidal CO2 instead go down. Some of these things can include um, issues with regards to low cardiac output or pulmonary embolism. Uh, severe metabolic acidosis, including from diabetic ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, or septic shock are other situations where patients will have a very high minute ventilation and try to drive down their CO2. Um, anxiety and hyperventilation are, are other causes of low end tidal CO2 and um, very pertinent to this patient, mucus plugging and tracheostomy dislodgement can cause rises in end tidal CO2, not rises in our arterial CO2 due to mucus plugging or trach dislodgement where your exhaled um, breath is not actually getting to the CO2 monitor. So in terms of the bedside management for this patient, you go and you examine the patient and the patient has decreased breath sounds on the right chest. Um, so the patient ends up getting disconnected from the ventilator just to exclude any mechanical issues and you can manually bag mask ventilate the patient with 100% FiO2. But when you're bag mask ventilating, you notice that there's an increased amount of resistance on each, um, each of your um, uh, baggings. And so, um, Based upon that, you go in and use a red rubber catheter and remove thick secretions. And then notice that the pulse ox begins to improve, our end tidal CO2 rises and the heart rate normalizes, suggesting that this patient had a um, mucus plug. And so in terms of discussion points for this case, we, um, it's really um, important as much as Paul 
um, talked about causes that would um, cause a rise in entitled CO2. Um, if you have a failure of exhaled CO2 to reach our capnography measurement, you may see an abrupt change with a lowering of entitled CO2. And so it's very important when patients and when we're in, in situations where we're using entitled CO2 as a measure that we're monitoring that uh, our nursing staff and our respiratory therapists, um, that everybody understands what uh, that we need to intervene both upon acute changes in the positive and the negative direction with regards to entitled CO2. I think important for this patient, um, other considerations that I would have had um, in him if we wouldn't have found the mucus plug, you know, a dislodged tracheostomy is something that is uh, potentially catastrophic in um, a patient on the floor, and it's very important that everybody understands the medical, the management that we should have at the bedside of a dislodged tracheostomy, which generally this close to an ex, uh, this close to tracheostomy placement would include removal of the tracheostomy and um, um, closure um, manually and then actually trying to intubate and ventilate from above rather than advancing the tracheostomy tube. Another consideration, a patient had been in the hospital for two weeks would be pulmonary, pulmonary embolism, but because the hemodynamics and the oxygenation improved so quickly, that seemed less likely. Um, and I think that when we have patients in the step-down unit, trach, on the fan, it's really important that we always recognize risk factors for mucus plugging and try to minimize them. Some of these include inadequate humidification of our respiratory circuit, obviously infections including pneumonia, tracheitis, and certain medications including ipratropium, which can desiccate our secretions or scopolamine. Um, which can sometimes be used to manage some of the oral secretions, but can um, decrease our secretions. Um, it can decrease the viscous, the, it can increase the viscosity of our secretions. So in terms of prevention of events like this, it's really important that we recognize risk factors for postoperative trach complications and it, especially in our patients who are really rapid, very close to the um, tracheostomy placement, really using appropriate monitoring, including heart rate monitoring, oxygen saturation, and, and tidal CO2 monitoring. Uh, and it's, as we talked about, very important for our nursing staff, respiratory therapy staff, and, and everybody else involved in patient care to recognize what are some of the causes of abrupt changes in entitled CO2. So, so any questions? So I know we have an issue in our unit. A lot of times the trainees will very often mix epitropian nebulizers with things like saline nebs. What do you think? So I think, you know, it's interesting. I think that, um, that when you look at saline nebulization, it, was, it started actually originally in the CF literature and hypertonic saline, which actually is really bronchospastic. And so there was a move towards trying everybody on that, realizing actually we may do harm in a non-CF bronchiectasis or in the in patients without CF bronchiectasis. So then we've moved to some things like just um, nebulize 0.9 normal saline nebs, and I think that um, my experience has been that that oftentimes helps with regards to respiratory secretions, but um, it for sure, um, uh, frequent use of atrovin is one of my pet peeves when I'm on service mm -hmm. <laughs> because we really shouldn't be doing it one, more than once every six hours just from the standpoint of getting anticholinergic toxicity. Um, what about patients who come in now that we have a, a big uh, nursing home population with patients leaving the hospital or going to LTACs with tracheostomies and um, coming into your institution with a, a different trach than you're used to using? Is that uh, something that you would recommend keeping because it's the patient came in with, or would you switch it to what your staff and um, uh, institutions used to using? That's a great question. I think I had that come up on service last time I was on. I think that um, we have to like always recognize some of these really chronically um, vented for a long time patients. They're, they end up with tracheomalacia and other things, and that we may not, our, our um, tracheostomies that we use in our hospital may not be best suited for the extra long modified trach that, that they really need. And so um, 
I think it's important that as much as we all have familiarity with what we use um, at our institutions that people are able to troubleshoot and making sure that that when a patient comes in that we have on hand um, whatever the other trach care is whether it be extra inner cannulas or even an extra tracheostomy because it, obviously airway uh, airway management um, if not done properly can be devastating and so we need to do it properly. Yeah. What's your opinion of <coughs> for treating the suspected mucus plug? Obtaining a chest x-ray first, using a blind red rubber to alleviate if you feel suspected pressure, or perhaps enrolling a disposable bronchoscopy via an established tracheostomy. Yeah, so these new disposable tracheostomies are really, uh, new disposable tra um, uh, bronchoscopes Bronco. are really amazing in terms Although sometimes these really thick secretions, I've had a hard time removing with the yep. disposable bronchoscopies, but I agree if um, in the ideal situation, if a rapid response is called and chest x-ray comes with the rapid response, then you can get some of this information very quickly, but oftentimes there's a lag in between when, when the rapid response is called or when the monitor is alarm and when, when we can get radi radiology there, and so I think that we are unfortunately put in the position oftentimes that we have to rely on our physical exam and in terms of trying to go down our differential of what, what could have caused this acute change while we're waiting for the imaging and other things. Right. Yeah. And I think we have to be careful too much manipulation down yes. the trach, especially a fresh trach. Oh, for sure. It could sure, lead to sure. devastating yeah, complications. Yeah, yeah. And I agree with you that reintubation from above should be prepared for. Exactly, exactly. So we actually had two questions from the audience, one from William, one from Nicole, uh, both talking about capnography and remote monitoring. Do you think this is the best early warning system? Are there others that are better? And again, if cost being no barrier, is this what you'd recommend? I really think that uh, capnography is a very powerful tool if used properly and with um, staff that understands how to use it and understands just as we understand a SAD of 85, we need to uh, intervene upon people understanding that if there are rapid changes in untitled CO2s, that these are, uh, these are early warning signs. Um, you know, I, I think that um, our uptake at our institution of untitled CO2 monitoring in the ICU and in the post-operative setting has probably really been um, very beneficial in terms of not uh, in terms of understanding early if things have happened, even if it's that an endotracheal tube has become dislodged during the course of turning or, or whatever else. And so, um, if money was no option, every patient could have it. <laughs> It's interesting, I think, in our unit, we're even using end title a lot of times for ACLS and looking yes. at, you know, reestablishment of an end title greater than 15 for a point rise yeah. as return of spontaneous circulation even before we do a pulse check. So actually even delaying pulse checks and looking at end title as yeah. a means of return of circulation. So I, I would agree. I think it's probably one of the better modalities we have available yeah. now. Yeah, my fear is as we recognize it's a great modality, as we institute it, my biggest fear is that it would become something that is attached to an alarm that you will go on to de develop alarm fatigue. The same kind of fatigue we're seeing with a lot of our apnea monitors in the post anesthesia care unit where the monitor's beeping. The patient appears to be breathing about eight or 10 times a minute. The monitor's reading zero because it's improperly affixed and the alarm is just silenced rather than the patient looked at. So I hope we can continue to institute more capnography but we have to find a way that one, as Monica said, people know how to use it, both if it's too high or it's too low, and two, there's got to be a way that you don't have alarm fatigue, that it's ignored. For sure. Excellent. For sure. Okay. We're going to go on to our next case. So it's respiratory compromise in the endoscopy suite. So on a very standard day, a 36-year-old presents for pre-evaluation for his bariatric surgery. There's not much for past medical history. He has some osteoarthritis in both knees, non dependent diabetes. He's morbidly obese, which is part and parcel with the procedure. He's 5'11 and 342 pounds. And it's a BMI of about 47.7. You know, on a quick exam, he's a double chin, a very thick neck, and a malampati score of 4. And his blood pressure is 173 over 101 in his pre-op evaluation, but he does admit to high blood pressure. And during your intake admission of the patient, he admits to some pretty loud snoring, and his wife says she often nudges him as he stops breathing during sleeping. So 
His endoscopy starts, you know, like a very standard outpatient endoscopy anesthetic would. He gets two milligrams of midazolam, 100 micrograms of fentanyl, and a propofol infusion is started, a very, you know, modest dose of 80 micrograms per kilogram per minute. You know, multiple small boluses of propofol are used because he keeps trying to remove the scope and that's impeding the procedure. But when the procedure is done and the scope is removed, his saturations immediately drop into the 80s. And the anesthesia team notes very quickly, a jaw thrust brings back his breathing, bring back his saturations, a non-rebreather was applied. And after several minutes of stable saturation, stable breathing, he's moved to a stretcher and then to recovery room. In recovery, he's still extremely sleepy. He's still on a non-rebreather, and his saturation is only holding the low 90s. But 20 minutes after PACU arrival, his vital signs are still not great. His heart rate's risen to the 110 range. His BP is now 200 over 110. His saturations are back in the upper 80s. And he's not very responsive to voice or sternal rub. And his blood gas is what you see. It's 705, 95, 52, with a saturation of 86. So really what you should be thinking is what's the cause of his mental status change? What's the cause for this acidosis? And what can be done to reverse this deterioration? I mean, so it's really the differential diagnosis of acute hypercarbia in the post-operative setting, post-procedural setting. And hypoventilation, secondary to medication is the first thing that of course comes to mind. I mean, this patient did receive lots of hypoventilatory inducing sedatives, midazolam, fentanyl, propofol. Most of these drugs are relatively short acting and the bulk of his anesthetic was from propofol and with its very large distribution, it should have cleared much more rapidly than over the course of the 20 minutes we're talking about here. I mean, increased CO proof production is always an issue. And anytime somebody gets an anesthetic, it should always be on your mind. One of the things in your differential should be things like malignant hyperthermia. In this patient's case, that's not really an issue. No triggering drugs have been given. He's been given no volatile anesthetics, no succinylcholine. This should be lower in your differential. It shouldn't you know, <coughs> even cross your mind during an endoscopy case of this type. I mean, rebreathing. Many gastroenterologists now are using carbon dioxide. I know most of ours are. We've stopped using air and insufflating during the procedure with carbon dioxide has been it dramatically improved to patient comfort. They're able to clear the gas more quickly. They're able to actually feel better in the recovery room. They're less bloated much more quickly. The only drawback is you get a lot of significant CO2 inhalation during the procedure. Because you can imagine as you're insufflating the stomach, a lot of the gas has to escape. It's going to come up the, uh, the esophagus. It's going to mix with whatever inspiratory gas you're giving them. They're going to get a lot of CO2 rebreathing and mostly from the insufflation. So it's definitely something that should be on your mind. And then of course, given the size of our patient this procedure, air, upper airway obstruction has got to be on your differential. And this is always exacerbated things like sedatives due to intrinsic muscle relaxation, and especially in those patients with sleep apnea. So obstructive sleep apnea is a really big deal. The American Sleep Apnea Association, 48% of Americans suffer from snoring. The CDC puts it at nearly 40% of snorers have reported falling asleep during the daytime. And 5% of those people even report, asleep of, report falling asleep or feeling sleepy while driving in the last month, the last 30 days. And that's 25 million Americans suffering with sleep apnea, even more worldwide, which as much as 20% of women and almost 30% of men. So one of the things we like to do in the perioperative setting is we assess stop bang as part of our pre-anesthetic evaluation. It's simple, it's easy, it's eight quick questions. You know, first S, do you snore? You know, T, are you tired during the day? Do you feel daytime fatigue? O, has anyone observed you stop breathing when you sleep? P, do you have or are you beating for high, uh, being treated for high blood pressure? B, BMI greater than 35? A, age greater than 50? Neck circumference greater than 40 centimeters or 15.7 inches. Much easier on a gentleman who usually knows his shirt size <laughs> than it is on a lady. And then gender male. Males are definitely more likely, as you saw from the last slide, to have sleep apnea than uh, ladies. And then eight points, eight questions. If you have three or more points, these patients should be referred to testing. But in the perioperative period, these are patients you should watch out for obstructive sleep apnea. We actually do label them with blue bands that say OSA to kind of give us a, an extra clue that these are patients to be watched more closely in the recovery room. This patient is clearly high risk. He has six of the eight criteria. He snores, he has observed apneas by his wife. He presents with high blood pressure even though he's not being treated. His BMI is clearly greater than 35. He's male. And the description of a very large neck with a double chin, he likely has a neck circumference that's greater than 16 centimeters. So even weak set of things like alcohol, things you might do on a normal evening with a glass of wine with dinner,
will relax your oropharyngeal muscle tone, it dramatically worsens your sleep apnea problems, and will cause hypercarbia even in otherwise normal patients. Acute doubling of arterial carbon dioxide causes narcosis. It depresses breathing, decreases responsiveness, and interesting studies back in the 60s and 70s looked at patients with CO2s greater than 200 milligrams of mercury of carbon dioxide. These patients could undergo a surgical procedure and 50% of them probably would not move to a surgical incision. Just showing how potent a narcotic agent high doses of carbon dioxide can be. And so one of the ways I like to start with these patients, I mean, clearly a jaw thrust worked in the procedure room. I like to start with a nasopharyngeal airway. It's easy to place, it's minimally invasive on patients that are already depressed due to either sedation, due to medication, due to hypercarbia or OSA. It can really open up your airway and really free up your hands for other things. Things to keep in mind if patients are on anticoagulation or, uh, or antiplatelet agents, you gotta be careful, it's a relative contraindication. I mean, you can place a nasopharyngeal airway carefully and properly without causing too much bleeding. Usually start small. Find the smallest nasal pharyngeal airway you have. Lube it very well. And again, insert very gently going straight back and not up. Please remember the cremiform plate is right above the nasal pharyngeal airway. I have seen CSF leaks caused by nasal pharyngeal insertions. And then when you do place in that nasal pharyngeal airway, upsize it if you think you need it. Put in a seven or 7.5 French airway. You don't get good, relieving of the, uh, good relief of the obstruction. You can upsize to an eight or an 8.5 and work your way up from there. The wider board not only helps reduce obstruction, it's also longer. For patients that are taller or a greater obstruction, you need that longer airway to really get past the soft palate. Another thing I like to use is non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, CPAP or BiPAP. CPAP can be used to stent open the airway. It's what most people will use at home when they've been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea. And that goes back most often because that was the easiest machine to create, and so it's the one that most patients still use. BiPAP, or bi-level positive airway pressure, stents open the airway in between breaths with EPAP, just the way CPAP would do, but also synchronizes with breathing with an inspiratory positive airway pressure, or IPAP, that can augment tidal line for those patients who are, have a central hypoventilation syndrome from being obese, or from being older, from having a neurologic component. And where CPAP can help stent the airway, BiPAP has been shown to dramatically reduce CO2 much better than CPAP, especially in those patients with central hypoventilation. And the best part is CPAP and BiPAP both work synergistically with things like nasopharyngeal airways. You can stent the airway a little bit mechanically, stent it a little bit with air, and then provide a BiPAP, you can dramatically improve your ventilation. And so let's follow up on our patient in the recovery room. A 7.5 French nasal trumpet or nasopharyngeal airway is placed, and then it's upsized to an 8.5 French because the 7.5 just wasn't big enough, and with the upsize you do note better air entry. And our patient's neurologically depressed. A full mass BiPAP is placed, so he doesn't have to worry about uh, nose versus mouth breathing. And it started at 10 over 7, 10 centimeters of water pressure insufflation pressure with 7 of EPAP. And that's only an airway difference pressure of 3. Remember, with BiPAP, it's not pressure support over PEEP. It's total high pressure over total low pressure. And starting with an FiO2 of 100%, his saturation improves very rapidly to 97%. But his initial end title is still in the 80s. And while you note there's some decreased obstruction, your tidal volumes are still very poor. They're still three, three, uh, 300, 350. So come up on your, your uh, inspiratory pressure, now to 15 centimeters of water. And again, aim for that goal tidal volume, a resting respiratory volume of six to eight milliliters per kilo for, every, for predicted body weight based on his height. You know, and you should be decreasing your FiO2. And then your goal is not to make the patient 100% sat. While it makes you feel better, it's not gonna help the patient clinically. Aim for that saturation of 92%. Less oxygen is better. It allows for better hypoxic basic constriction. You'll VQ match. Your patient will recover faster with less effort. So over the next 20 minutes, you're gonna notice this re patient's respiratory pattern is gonna get better. It's more regular. His respiratory rate will increase from 25 to 30, and this patient will start breathing more regularly because now you've relieved the obstruction. And with the increased IPAP, the increased inspiratory pressure, your tidal volumes will come up. It'll be much more sufficient for this man's size. As your oxygen comes down, you can come down as low as you can. I usually like to come down to 30 or 25%. These are patients that walked in with good room air saturations. They should not need much supplemental oxygen. And with that, you'll notice a faster decrease in your end tidal carbon dioxide as the patient starts to hypoxic constrict. And they start to actually shunt blood away from those areas of atelectasis due to his size due to his obstruction into areas that are better perfused and better ventilated. So over time, he'll be more awake. 
and you can take off the BiPAP and nasopharyngeal airway. You can leave them off supplemental oxygen. Our policy, patients that receive an OSA blue band, patients that are high risk, or patients that have observed obstructions in the recovery room, we keep them for two hours. We want to see their mental status maintained. We want to see their saturation maintained on room air at or near their baseline. And after two hours, they're looking good. We can discharge them home. So any questions? So Steve, if you see that somebody has um, COPD, uh, not necessarily this patient, but um, do you ever recommend to the endoscopist to use air rather than CO2 for the procedure, like kind of trying to preemptively remove that as a potential cause of respiratory failure? I always find it's, it's a really hard balance. So if you switch to air, there's a lot less rebreathing, but the stomach's gonna stay distended longer, the belly's gonna get more distended, you're gonna stand your small bowel from all the insufflation. So these patients may have a more you know, distended lower abdomen, putting a lot more pressure on their lungs, making it harder to breathe. Mm -hmm. But the contrary is then you get problems with hypercapnia, rebreathing, these patients make an acidotic intraprocedure. I think a lot of it is just very carefully sedating the patients. And the benefits we have as anesthesiologists is by using shorter acting drugs, infusion drugs like propofol, it's very incumbent on us to lower those doses as things progress, especially if you notice the patient becoming more sedated at the same doses. I mean, the benefit you'll get from using air, I think, might be outweighed by the extensive distension you're going to see in the recovery room. So I very rarely have them switch to air from CO2 anymore. Really, I'm pretty much saving it for those patients that have severe pulmonary hypertension or that are already severely hypercapnic at baseline with a tracheostomy for hypercapnic failure where that margin for error for hypercapnia is already so low that the little distension is probably worth it. And do you think, so as a pulmonologist, we do bronchoscopies all the time and actually don't have anesthesiologists present for the bronchoscopies. I know at other institutions they do that differently with anesthesiology present, but what do you think about the person who's performing the procedure also being in charge of um, the sedation because as, um, as a non-anesthesiologist, we don't always have propofol and some of these other short-acting agents available to our rescue. I think it's hard. I'm definitely biased. I love yeah. what I do, and I think we provide a great service for yeah. these short procedures. Patients can get much longer, uh, much less long-acting sedatives. Right. And things like fentanyl we don't consider long-acting in the ICU 45, 60 minutes, but compared to things like propofol, 5, 10 minutes, it's incredibly long-acting, especially for patients that are already kind of teetering on that edge. If you need us, we're always there. We're happy to expand <laughs> our services. But I think a lot of what needs to be careful is really try to focus on your adjunctives, things like nebulized lidocaine, spraying the vocal cords well, trying to minimize the sedation if you don't need it, and trying to encourage the patient that everything's okay and reduce any sedatives you can give. But again, if you need us propofol, we can always provide. Yeah. I have a question. Um, I love the fact that you use the nasal trumpet. I, I think it's a tool that a lot of people forget that we have in our arsenal. Um, but one of the things that is around that people use is the oral airway. When do you decide to use an oral airway versus a nasal trumpet in a patient like this that you're evaluating that has uh, respiratory compromise? That's a really great question. It's one we talk to our residents a lot about. So for patients that have been anesthetized, I mean, we very often prior to intubation, after a full induction of general anesthesia, will provide an oral airway. It allows us to mass bag ventilate. We can get very comfortable control of the patient's airway. And the benefit is they are anesthetized. The risk of airway compromise, the risk of airway complication at that point, especially because they're not fighting, you don't have to fight the jaw, you can place that very gently and you can get a really great open airway. The drawback about this patient is the goal is to wake this patient up. These patients, as they emerge from anesthesia or from CO2 necrosis, have to go through this stage two of anesthetic, this emergent phase, which anesthesiologists or critical care intensivists will tell you is a very hyperreactive phase. Not only can patients be, you know, for lack of a better word, punch drunk, angry, flailing, upset, and they have to go through that phase. The drawback is their airways become hyperreactive. Their vocal cords can become spastic. You can get things like bronchospasm, laryngospasm. So in these kinds of patients, I really avoid oral airways. If you have to do it to get you over the hump, I think that's something you can do. But the only drawback is if you leave that in too long, you may miss your window and now you have a patient that was hypercaptic, now they're in laryngospasm. Now you're giving them you know, medications to treat something you've caused instead of treating something that was a side effect from the procedure itself. And I think, just as you mentioned, nasal trumpets, nasopharyngeal airways are, they're really 
almost relegated now to EMTs and anesthesiologists. We use them all the time. We keep them available in seven or eight different sizes all lined up in the drawer. I mean, and a lot of times we'll intubate through them. We'll do nasal, uh, nasal fiber optics through them. It dramatically makes procedures easier. And you can avoid really getting at, you know, putting in an oropharyngeal airway, which I've had residents remove uvulas. And that's a lot of bleeding you don't want to get into. <laughs> Make the airway tough. Now Steve is a surgeon and does endoscopy part of the time. I'm worried about the distended stomach or the gastroparetic stomach. And this patient clearly benefited and avoided intubation by non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. But I think it's pretty tough and how to make that call of when to use it and when to avoid it because they have risk of post-procedure emesis, which can be disastrous if you have a full face mask on board. So I think a lot of times it goes back to what Monica asked, you know, the difference between air and carbon dioxide. So I think usually when you come for an endoscopy, we're going to might be insufflating the stomach for 20, 30 minutes at times. I'm less concerned about emesis at that point, mostly because they've already tolerated 20 or 30 minutes of direct stomach insufflation. They have a belly full of, you know, be it air or carbon dioxide at this point. And the best part is as an endoscopist, the last thing you're going to do is you're going to clean all that out on the way out. Yep. So as long as you're careful with your settings and you allow the patient to synchronize their breathing, don't force it. Don't set a backup respiratory rate of 30 because you want to correct the CO2 right away. You know, let the backup rate stay like 8 to 10. Try to really work on you know, increasing your expiratory positive airway pressure to stent the airway, the in, uh, inspiratory pressure to really support the breathing. Allow them to breathe 8 to 12 as you adjust to improve the obstruction. They'll increase their respiratory rate on their own. If you force it, you're going to distend them. They're going to vomit. Let them go slow. It can be problematic to watch because you have SATs in the 80s, you have end tidal carbon dioxide in the 90s or 100s. It will get better. You just have to kind of get yourself past that acute anxiety phase yourself while the patient's still out. I think that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on to our last case. All right, we're going to discuss just briefly some respiratory compromise in the setting of elective surgery. So this is a 65-year-old man. He has hypertension, obesity, with a BMI coming in at about 35, and diabetes, and he presents for a laparoscopic repair of a large, recurrent left inguinal hernia. He had unremarkable preoperative labs with a hemoglobin A1C below 6. His EKG was sinus rhythm, and his chest X-ray um, was clear bilaterally. He did have a remote history of tobacco use, but had quit 10 years ago and he had no history of anesthetic complications with a prior shoulder surgery. So he was taken to the operating room and he had a two hour operation roughly under general anesthesia. And during the case, this being a large um, partially incarcerated inguinal hernia was in Trendelenburg position for most of the case. But at the end, he was extubated in the operating room and he was transported uh, to the recovery room on nasal cannula, just three liters. Immediately post-op, he received one dose of Ketorolac for pain control, and in the post-anesthesia care unit was receiving boluses of fentanyl, and then as he woke up more, got a single dose of oxycodone for groin pain. One hour later, his pulse ox had decreased to about 89% on one liter nasal cannula, as his oxygen had been down titrated, and his covering nurse seeing the change on the monitor, increased the flow of his nasal cannula to six liters a minute, and then noticed him being more of a mouth breather, so placed on an oxygen-containing humidified face tent in order to correct the number on the screen. His oxygen saturation immediately increased to 99, 100%. Over the next 45 minutes, though, he progresses to apnea, and then bradycardia, and then arrest. So a couple of discussion points I want to bring up for this case are, what were the risk factors for failure in this particular case for this patient? And what mechanisms could have contributed and actually caused his respiratory failure? Next, did the supplemental oxygen that was added contribute to his decompensation? And had he been on a continuous either apnea monitor or end tidal CO2 monitor, which sometimes are not ubiquitous in all um, small cases or surgery center cases, um, could that this have prevented his progression to dysrhythmia? So specific risk factors for respiratory compromise. Uh, Dr. Miller mentioned one, OSA, and going back to stopping mnemonic, not knowing the snoring history or 
breathing the rest during sleep history of this patient. You can gather that he's over 50, he's male, he has a BMI of 35, and he came in with hypertension. That already gives him four points on stopping, and so makes him at high risk for obstructive sleep apnea. Besides that, there's another body of literature that shows age greater than 60, male gender again, a ASA class, your albumin level, cardiac failure, history of COPD, or your preoperative functional status can put you at risk for immediate postoperative respiratory compromise. In addition to just patient risk factors, there have looked at a lot of anesthetic factors, including was the case done under general anesthesia, the opioids that the patient received, and other medications that can be respiratory depressant, was there a neuromuscular blockade for the case, and in this case, Definitely, and as a surgeon, we're always asking to, can you please paralyze the patient so I can get my mesh in place? <laughs> so that's a big factor, which can have downsides. And surgical factors, there's incision size, there's location of your incisions, and the type of surgery. And there's been a lot of look, specifically at laparoscopy in both bariatrics, cholecystectomies, and laparoscopic sigmoids, that shows overall there's a decreased risk of respiratory compromise postoperatively by doing the case laparoscopic, but there's some careful considerations such as your CO2 insufflation, and as depending on the ports you use, the duration of your operation, and the patient's tissue integrity, you can actually get increases in end tidal CO2 from long insufflation times, which can contribute to postoperative respiratory failure. So what other mechanisms are unique, or not just to the post anesthesia of care unit, but need to be watched for? Um, atelectasis is a big one. Atelectasis can come for many reasons. In general anesthesia, when you fill the alveoli with 100% FAO2, um, you get impaired surfactant function, you have compressive atelectasis from having the patient in Trendelenburg, and increasing their intra-abdominal pressure that pushes the diaphragm cephalad. Um, this all can contribute to respiratory failure. You have hypoventilation, whether it be from hypercapnia, drug-induced opioids. You have airway obstruction, such as in the patient who's at high risk for obstructive sleep apnea. And this all leads to progressive worsening of a VQ mismatch. So supplemental oxygen in the recovery unit. It's important, it's pretty ubiquitous, we use it all the time, and sometimes it's easy to forget that oxygen has minuses as well as pluses. Um, you definitely want to improve oxygen saturation, um, and using it can be not only therapeutic, but diagnostic. If your SAT rapidly improves, you have alveolar hyperventilation, or it can rapidly fix hypoxemia and hypoventilation, whereas oxygen titration in the setting of a mechanical or fixed shunt, like a pulmonary embolism, may not so rapidly improve. However, the effect of high FiO2 delivery immediately in the PACU, i.e. targeting a saturation of 100%, has not been shown to improve patient outcomes at all. In fact, you should be targeting an arterial oxygen saturation of about 60 or a SAT of about 90, 91%. And supplemental oxygen, this is largely because supplemental oxygen can worsen a VQ mismatch and alveolar collapse. So your treatment options are important. Once you, um, you need to be dependent on the underlying cause of the hypoxemia. Yes, as just mentioned, you need to deliver adequate oxygen to the tissues, but you don't need to de deliver 100% uh, or you do not need to achieve 100% oxygen saturation. So more is not necessarily better. Whereas recruitment maneuvers that have a role in atelectasis, and then there's CPAP or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, or even now high flow nasal cannula that may have some benefit in the recovery unit. You know, immediately jumping to Narcan and Flumazenil, you need to consider the risks and benefits, and increased pain, arrhythmias. And I really think the take home from this case would have been prevention. You recognize the patient-specific risk factors for post-operative respiratory compromise and you need to take into consideration preoperatively your operative choice, manner the anesthetics, the analgesia in the post-op units, and really the treatment for the hypoxemia needs to depend on the underlying cause. And I'm going to end with advocating that saturation, apnea, and end tidal CO2 are all pretty important in the post immediate post-op period and should be instituted. So we'll take some questions. I mean, we have an interesting question from Megan.
I mean, really looking at what is the benefit of the capnography in early detection. I think in all these cases, I think we've all highlighted why we are big fans of end tidal. I mean, Amanda, what do you think in, in the post-operative period? If that patient had an end tidal, do you think you would have seen things coming a little earlier? I think if one, yes, he, if he would have, we would have seen it coming. And then the second part of that is people need to recognize the problems of either high or low CO2. So we need not only the monitors, but we need to institute the training. Yeah. So Paul, one of the questions from the audience came from Teresa looking towards you for the asthma case. If end tidal wasn't available, how often would you have gotten your arterial blood gases? That's a great question. So I think depending on um, the patient's uh, response to the albuterol therapy, the short-acting beta agonists, and what their peak flows are doing are um, kind of our clues. We're usually doing um, reassessment at least every hour um, to see how they're responding to the therapy. And if there's any hint that they may be having any fatigue or failure, we're usually doing blood gases every hour. Um, because as we know and kind of talked about in this case, uh, carbon dioxide of 35 means the patient's got the energy and the drive to be able to maintain ventilation. But in an asthmatic who is working very hard as the CO2 normalizes to 40, um, they may actually be in failure or fatigue. So um, being able to catch that early is key to be able to prevent these patients from being intubated. So that's usually our practice is like you know, almost every hour if needed. Would you space them out more if you had an end tidal? Would it provide a little more comfort? Uh, definitely. If we have end tidal CO2 um, and we see correlation on a gas or two, um, we're very comfortable in using that as our monitoring um, based and also not a sole number, but looking at the patient's uh, response with peak flows, their mental status, and doing full physical exam, which you know not one number can um, take, a, take a place of. Yeah. So we had a corollary part. I mean, you mentioned correlation. What happens when your end tidal and your arterial blood gas don't correlate? Well, we've been, um, we see that sometimes in our uh, mechanically intubated patients where the correlation isn't great, but we still use it for trending. And I think it's still a good tool to see if it is increasing, um, even if the, there is a discordant number based on your blood gas and your end tidal. If you see the number going up or going down, it is a, um, an indication to investigate. I think Paul's point is very key, is using a trend or using a number as a tool to investigate further mm -hmm. and treat the underlying cause, rather than using a number alone to trigger a, an automatic response. And I think that's really important in the role of capnography mm -hmm. in all of these settings, is that institute the mandate that a change for a, a particular patient should be an absolute mm -hmm. trigger to investigate. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of what we talked about is that VQ mismatch that comes with obstructive sleep apnea, with asthma, that comes with hypoventilation of the PACU, that comes with mucus plugging. That's a lot of times going to affect that end tidal gradient, the difference between your end tidal carbon dioxide and your arterial CO2. I mean, we see that a lot together in the operating room when we have patients that you know, are in that steep trend where that have high insufflation pressure, we'll see an end tidal gradient. So even though you're insufflating with CO2, I'll increase my ventilation. I'm going to see a disproportional decrease a lot in my end tidal. And a lot of times that's VQ mismatch. It's a lot of atelectasis due to positioning, abdominal compartment shift, due yeah. to insufflation pressure, I didn't give enough paralysis. Yeah. I mean, all those things are to reflect that arterial gradient difference. And, you know, we talked about, you know, giving that recruitment breath, bringing back the lungs and really insufflating. We'll do it in the operating room. We'll give a couple of good recruitment breaths to kind of open things up and go to a higher level of PEEP. Mm -hmm. Especially in a laparoscopic case when the head is down, I like to come up to eight or even 10 of people to really open those lungs up and really try to not normalize the CO2, but at least improve my CO2 gradient because I know that's a lot of what the issue is. Right. And again, minimizing oxygen, you know, coming down that 30, 40%, even in the operating room, is the time likely that the oxygen is going to cause damage? Probably not. But I think in doing so, I'll improve my VQ matching. I'll get my end tidal under control, including my gradient. And I think it'll give you more time to work and me less time futzing with the vent. <laughs> That's true. Very good. Uh, so with that, I think we're out of questions. And thank you all for coming. And thanks again to Medtronic for all your support for this webinar. We appreciate it. Hope you have a great day.